Hello everybody and thank you very much for coming to this session on science and the Victorian public. My name is Gowan Dawson and I'm from the School of English at the University of Leicester. You'll notice that, that I'm not dressed in a top hat or in Victorian garb at all. This, this is in fact how I normally dress. So I've come in my own costume, that of a modern academic. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. <laughs> um, I should say, first of all, that this event is being recorded. You'll see Beris in the corner over there. So when we have a, a, a kind of session at the end when people can ask questions and come up and, and look at the Magic Lantern, do be aware that, that your question will be um, recorded. Um, now this is an event that's part of Literary Leicester and I know a lot of you will be going to other Literary Leicester events as well. But it's also part of another season which is called Being Human. You'll find on your chair a Being Human brochure and this is actually um, a national festival of the, the humanities that's run across the country and it runs from, when is it, the 17th to the 25th of November and there are another, a, a number of other events taking place both in Leicester and in the Midlands and elsewhere that you might be interested in. So do have a look at, at that. This event is hosted by a project of which I'm one of the directors that's funded by the AHRC, I have to say that. It's called Constructing Scientific Communities and you'll see a little uh, leaflet for it on your seat as well. And it's a collaboration between the Universities of Oxford and Leicester working with the Natural History Museum, the Royal Society and the Royal College of Surgeons and we're looking at how the ways in which in the 19th century people were invited to engage um, with um, science that these ways can also be used in the modern world particularly with new online citizen science platforms and I'll say a little bit of, more about that at the end but first of all I want to take us back into the 19th century and to talk about why science and the Victorian public well, just as natural knowledge had been part of the coffeehouse culture of the 18th century, so in the Victorian era, science was also conducted in the public gaze, particularly in things like museums, exhibitions, and lectures. And it's scientific lecturing that we're going to be thinking about today. Science was part of a, a broader movement that was often called rational recreation, which was a way of both entertaining and educating ordinary men and women, and most importantly, it was a way of talking to them about useful things like science, but avoiding contentious subjects like religion or politics. So at rational recreation meetings, you, could, you wouldn't be able to talk about chartism, but you definitely could talk about kangaroos. And in our current era of Brexit and Donald Trump and all those kind of things, it's probably a, a good idea to have events where you can't talk about politics. We, we tend to spend all our time talking about politics at the moment, not in a very happy way. Now, one of the things about rational recreation is it was often disseminated through sight and sound rather than just through reading, and particularly in scientific lectures. And these lectures were often accompanied by really spectacular visual presentations as well, many of which using the magic lantern. You see here before you a magic lantern. Now, a magic lantern um, is a piece of technology that has existed really since the 17th century in fairly <coughs> rudimentary forms. It's also known less romantically as an optical lantern, but I, I think we should keep magic lantern. We keep some magic in it. And it's in the Victorian age that it reached its technological heyday. It's a device used to, to project transparent images, which are generally um, painted onto glass, although later they were, they were photographed onto glass, onto a screen. And in the mid-19th century, the images on glass slides were projected by what was called limelight, which is a gas flame of oxyhydrogen combined with the mineral quicklime, which created an intensely brilliant light that could project images at more than 30 feet. And this enabled magic lanterns to be used in very large lecture theatres um, before great big audiences greatly <coughs> increasing their educational value. This is also, of course, where we get the word limelight that we talk about in terms of people being famous and in the limelight today. Now, the, the greater projection um, distances of magic lanterns meant that you could have specially built theatres. These were called optical theatres. Ours is a, it, it's a kind of rough uh, recreation of an optical theatre, but the most famous of these was at the Royal Polytechnic Institute 
on Regent Street in central London. So we're going to have to um, imagine ourselves back into the Royal Polytechnic Institute um, on Regent Street. And there, scientific lecturers such as uh, the famous Professor John Henry Pepper would regale their audiences with wonders from the natural world. From microscope slides showing the microbial contents of just a drop of water from the filthy River Thames to huge vistas of American canyons or even views of the outer reaches of space that were just for the first time being explored by astronomers. There were also, and again for the very first time, imaginative scenes showing the prehistoric past when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. So if you thought that the, um, the modern franchise of Jurassic uh, Park films were anything new, I'm afraid you're wrong, that, that actually the Victorians were doing something very similar to Jurassic Park for themselves. Now, there was, however, a very big problem with the mid-Victorian magic lantern, and that's that the naked gas flame of oxyhydrogen that was so essential to its powers of projection was unfortunately highly inflammable. And there were numerous instances of fires starting in crowded optical theatres, creating panic and sometimes even death. So it's quite a dangerous thing to go and see a magic lantern show. By the end of the 19th century, safer electric arc lamps um, had replaced the naked flames in magic lanterns. And for all of our sakes, I'm happy to say that our lantern, the one that we're using today, is actually modernised, so it has an electric light bulb in it, there are no naked flames whatsoever, and everything here is above health and safety board. I'm, I'm sure we're all glad to, to hear that. Okay, now before handing you over to the people in, in top hats and crinolines, I just want to come back from the 19th century to the present, because one of the things that our project, Constructing Scientific Communities, is doing is working with um, an organisation called Zooniverse, which is the internet's largest platform for online citizen science projects and it has numerous projects and um, such wonderful ones as Bat Detective, Planet Hunters and Seafloor Explorer which allow um, ordinary people who aren't professional scientists to do real science through making and recording observations. And one of the things that our project has done is to develop its own Zooniverse project but a Zooniverse project in the humanities asking people to identify and classify images, wonderful woodcut images, in Victorian scientific periodicals. And this has the wonderful title Science Gossip, which is also the title of one of these science periodicals. And you'll see that we have a laptop on the piano there. So next to our, our magic lantern, we also have the, the latest um, technology. And at the end, there'll be the opportunity for you to, to go and have a go at Science Gossip and, and hopefully to whet your appetite um, for citizen science activities. So this is a, an event very much that brings the Victorians and the 21st century together and shows how the public became involved in science both then and now. Okay, so I'm going to hand over in just a moment, but I'm going to tell you who our wonderful presenters are. So this is Jeff Belknap, this is Matthew Well, this is Richard Fallon, and um, this is Leah Beerman here. Um, I don't know if you want to adopt Victorian names, but I'm, I'm not going to make them up for you, but I'm going to hand over to you guys. Thank you. We live in a gloriously visual world. Film, television, and internet all surround us. They give us a, a very specific way of reading the world visually. And we can't assume that the Victorians didn't also do this because they didn't necessarily yet have film, cinema, television, or the internet. The Victorian world was an incredibly visual world. But you have to, as an audience today, imagine a little bit that we don't live in a world of cinema. We don't live in a world of the moving image, nor do we live in a world just where every corner we turn we see images. Rather, we come to magic lantern shows, and magic lantern shows are things that are supposed to take us to other places. They're supposed to do many scientific things, but one of the main important things is to bring spectacle and to bring distance into our lives. So, for many Victorians, they may have had the railway, they may have had steamships, they may have traveled across Europe on their grand tour, but to travel to the Colorado Canyon, just adjacent to the Grand Canyon in America, would have been less likely or almost impossible in one's life. So coming to the Royal Polytechnic and viewing a Magic Lantern show was going on a journey, was teaching you science, was teaching you something about the world. 
was teaching you about the Grand Canyon. They were also essentially about teaching you important information about the scope and scale of the world as it existed in the 19th century. Mapping, understanding the global scale of continents, and understanding how the U, Britain, uh, Ireland, and Scotland fit into this wider space was also a very essential and important aspect of going on or going to a Magic Lantern show, bringing you to another place through maps, through educational information. These maps could be global, they could be uh, broad earth maps, or they could bring you to the much more specific, um, mapping the physical uh, terrain of Ireland. Ireland, uh, as many of you may know, uh, had a contentious uh, relationship with England during this period. So um, having spaces in which um, these contentious political spaces were imagined for Victorian audiences weren't as straightforward as we might imagine now. But um, this, unlike one of the earlier slides that we saw, is a photographic slide. It's showing you a topographical information of what Ireland is supposed to look like, giving you information of the mountain ranges and the spaces of the central plains of Ireland. It could also teach you something about the Northern Highlands, the Speyside, Clyde, Tweed, and the Neath Valley in Scotland. Uh, it could show you how to move up to these local sites. And it could also, color was an absolutely essential aspect of these slides. Being able to project color isn't a given, right? We can't assume that color was something people saw every day. Um, so when we have maps that have these gloriously multicolored layers, they tell us something different about the, the geographical and geological structure of, of Scotland, and they teach the audiences in a very specific visual way. The 19th century is also an important, one of the essential periods in both British history but in our global history for the expansion of empire. Empire becomes a key aspect of how Britain operates in this period. Mapping and being able to describe both physically and visually the spaces of either South America or, or Africa become absolutely essential um, key elements of the scientific, um, the scientific desire and mode in order to present um, spaces that were actively being colonized, actively being used for various different resources, whether that's the introduction and invention and use of rubber or gutta percha, um, which comes out of southern Africa, or whether that is going and colonizing spaces in the so-called New World. Mapping, being able to come and project a um, notion of what empire is supposed to be for is an essential aspect of Magic Lantern slides and Magic, Magic Lantern presentations. These aren't just passive things one goes and sits in. These are active um, objects in which you are supposed to receive information and change your world. Equally well, we could have larger, broader views of Africa. Um, we also had much smaller local spaces, or um, less, less local, but the Congo. The Congo becomes one of the, the key sites of Western Africa in order to, um, in terms of uh, exploration and um, discovering, so-called discovering by the, the uh, British explorers of these, um, these, these soon-to-be colonized spaces. Um, David Livingston, uh, one of the key players in the 19th century of exploring uh, the African continent, or exploring at least for the British. It was already explored by the inhabitants of Africa. Exploration um, is another one of the key aspects, uh, and it goes hand in hand with, with, uh, with the development and the establishment of the empire in this period. Uh, and this is exploration on a global scale. It's not just South America, Asia, and Africa, but it's also the poles. Towards the end of the 19th century, um, exploration into the polar regions by people such as Scott, uh, um, the Scott Polar uh, Expedition um, become absolutely 
um, based on or the dissemination of uh, the findings and the, the narrative around traveling to the, the polar regions rely on Magic Lantern presentations. It's about a visual narrative that um, exploring these previously unexplored regions uh, becomes absolutely essential. So Magic Lantern slides can take you all over the world. They can take you to South America, they can take you to Africa, they can take you to places almost no one in living history has ever been to, except for these few rare explorers. So these are scientific, they are cultural, they're political, and they are emotional uh, experiences. natural history um, and this is a time when people were increasingly going to live in cities but increasingly had an interest in going out into the natural world and observing it uh, so spring watch is, is nothing new really the, the Victorians did it first and they would take the, the, the practice of natural history involved going out into the field with your collecting net uh, catching insects such as these and uh, then taking them back and killing them and pinning them to a board so you could have a collection and you could study it at your leisure. Um, uh, so yes, this is an image of, um, uh, from a French book uh, on the metamorphosis of insects. Um, it was re then reproduced in a, a magazine, the popular science magazine which we've already mentioned, Science Gossip. And then here it is in a uh, magic lantern slide. So um, you can see how these images um, were kind of translated or, or reiterated in different forms, in different ways, um, to serve different purposes, to reach different audiences. Um, that is a moth of some description on a flower. Um, and it's interesting that that is a photograph. So obviously you have um, the sort of first uh, Normally, um, it's sort of in the start of the 19th century, you would only have produced sort of illustrations of, of natural historical objects, but later on, you could, it was possible to produce images like this. Um, um, this is another photograph, but um, it's a photograph of a um, herbarium sheet, um, which was uh, a press, so you would go and you would collect a flower or a plant um, from its natural habitat, and in order to Preserve it and to be able to study it later, um, you would then press it and dry it out um, so it wouldn't rot away, and then you would put it on a herbarium sheet. Um, and these would serve as type specimens, so they would be what you would refer to when identifying or describing that particular species. Um, and they have, if you go to any natural history museum now, they will have these in their herbarium. So this was also um, at a time when uh, the science of microscopy um, was uh, kind of developing and you had microscopes becoming better and better and um, more and more affordable. Um, so people were for the first time able to see microscopic things that they would never have, never have seen before. Um, this was obviously particularly interesting in, in the field of natural history. Um, we go to this one. Um, so, as in, like Gowan mentioned at the beginning, we have, uh, you have these exhibitions where you would see um, a single drop of water and the contents of a single drop of water. So in the case of the River Thames, um, like during the 19th century, that would have been some fairly unpleasant things that you would have seen. Uh, this is from a, a cleaner pond, I imagine, so various kind of algal or um, sort of um, micro, uh, microorganisms. Um, and there was also a degree of spectacle to um, to this uh, science of microscopy. So, um, as well as sort of, um, I mean, uh, looking at kind of large things, you would, you would have wonder, take wonder in seeing the, the very fine, fine structures of uh, these very, very tiny things. Um, and you would come to events such as this, um, and they would have uh, kind of microscopes and slides arranged around the room, and you could look and marvel at these things. And it was very much, um, yeah, a, a spectacle. Now, of course, natural history, you can't talk about natural history in the 19th century without referring to perhaps one of the most famous uh, and influential scientific theories of the 19th century, which is, of course, Charles Darwin's 
uh, theory of natural selection or evolution, um, as we've come to call it. Um, and um, so here we have, uh, yes, the, the, the development of this, this idea of uh, the gradual development of, um, uh, I think it's a rhinoceros, some distant uh, ancestor of a rhinoceros. And this was, of course, something that was controversial. Um, it raised difficult questions for Victorians. So here we have a uh, comparison between um, sort of mammal, uh, kind of, uh, is it a dog, skull of a dog, chimpanzee, and a man. Um, and this kind of raises important questions about man's place in nature. Are we, are we simply descended from mammals? Are we very, um, from sort of less developed mammals like the dog? Um, or are we in some, some way separate? Um, so yes, that was the control system, I think. Richard will now. So <clears throat> geology and paleontology were really born at the end of the 18th century, but it was only in the 19th century when they really became probably about as popular as they've ever been. So we have characters like Mary Anning and paleontologists like Mary Anning picking up fossils in the early 19th century. And fossil collecting became a hobby in which, as Guy mentioned at the beginning, you could rationally um, collect. You could, um, in your spare time, go to the beach and pick up ammonites. And that would be edifying, but also enjoyable, and also a way to get out of the city. Um, and that's something that town museums would begin to be built, and you could suddenly have your own local collection, like, <clears throat> for example, uh, New York Museum in Leicester, one of sort of the older museums in the country. But of course, whereas most fossils are sort of something you would see in a provincial museum, and nice fossils, femurs, things like that. A lot of fossil discoveries in the 19th century were very sensational. So Matt's just been talking about evolution. Here we have Archaeopteryx, which was believed to be a missing link between birds and reptiles when it was discovered. Immediately at the point when Darwin published The Origin of Species by means of natural selection, this fossil became a source of controversy. Obviously, natural selection and evolution had irreligious connotations, but for most people in the 19th century, and especially the first half, Geology and paleontology were really a way of discussing God's bounty, the plentifulness of nature, with very little irreligious connotations at all, unless you were a scurrilous, possibly French atheist, using it to further your own intentions. And so fossils like this um, can lead to the next slide. You might use them for a scientific lecture, a very technical one, showing individual aspects of a skeleton like this. So in time, just stuff you can see in the fossil material and not intended for a particularly wide audience. But contrast that with the next slide, which is something that really relates to the visual spectacular aspects of Victorian culture. Of course, you could collect fossils, but could you conjure up what the prehistoric world and extinct animals look like without things like magic lantern shows, which could project images of the animals, which were something that maybe the man of science wouldn't be willing to endorse as entirely accurate, but say someone uh, slightly less advanced in learning would need an image like this to understand and were very attractive to Victorians. And of course, even paleontologists need this kind of heuristic to understand what they're looking at, even if they're looking at a uh, femur or, or a winged bone. So this is Archaeopteryx as uh, it was believed to look. Uh, next slide, please. And so you have basic images, unspeculative images like the Archaeopteryx, but don't make too many guesses. But those can also lead to much more speculative, imaginative and uh, spectacular images like this. So this is an ideal view, it was called. So this isn't intended to represent a naturalistic sense of the prehistoric world, which was something that was maybe a little bit too ambitious at the time. It was intended to send you back to a generalised version of the post-glacial period of mammoths and cave bears and uh, Irish elk and things like that. And these are very attractive. Victorians would see these in panoramas in, say, Leicester Square, but they would also see them in magic lantern slides and popular science books, which tried to make them understand Things like the prehistoric world, they couldn't necessarily glean from uh, simple fossils. That makes that fit. And so you have that kind of image, which isn't intended to necessarily represent the prehistoric world as it was. But gradually, as confidence grows, artists start trying to depict more lifelike images of the prehistoric world. So here we have Iguanodon, which is famously one of the first dinosaurs named in Britain. Britain was very much the home of dinosaurs until the late 19th century. Iguanodon from Sussex. That was named in 1825, and this is a fairly late picture, but very confidently drawn, intended to look almost like uh, a photograph. Later in the 19th century, when Britain moves away uh, from being the home of paleontology, you find lots of incredible dinosaurs in America, 
And those can only come back to the British context via images through magical answer shows, through books, through popular science lectures. So things like Triceratops, a very complete dinosaur, look nothing like the images Victorians have been seeing for most of a century based on scattered bones here and there. Suddenly, incredible American discoveries which changed what people thought the dinosaur looked like came through to them through magic lantern shows, from visiting lecturers, um, and also from books. This is actually taken from a book called Evolution in the Past, where the plates, the book, the images have been turned into lantern slides because they seem to be particularly cinematographical, as one reviewer described. This is the very beginning of the cinema, and it's clashed over with magic lantern show in sort of a fairly organic manner. It blends together, and it's not necessarily a big divide between a moving image and a magic lantern show, which can create those effects. Here we have a uh, the Titan Theorem, I think Matt was looking at Titan Theorem earlier, because you can tell whereas the earlier image was very diagrammatical, unspeculative. This is really an attempt to depict a prehistoric animal as naturalistically as possible. It almost looks like a photograph, and these kind of images only really begin at the very end of the 19th century and in the Edwardian period. That's Titan Theorem, also known as Brontops, and there was a lot of controversy about the name of these animals, that people wanted to name as many as they could, so often they just named the same thing multiple times. And finally, as these museums I mentioned start to get more and more complete skeletons, we have to remember most of the 19th century, Victorian museums weren't full of things like you might see at the Naturalist Museum in London today, impressive full skeletons. There will be a leg, and that will be much more impressive. You may get full of things that are more recent, maybe museums have Irish deer, which are plentiful in Ireland. But to have a complete skeleton of an extinct animal was really quite an impressive haul, and only really when America starts to spill out its treasures from sort of the frontier, you start to get these things. But someone who is in, say, Leicester can't necessarily have a museum which is stacked entirely like this. The American Museum in New York had a fantastic collection, but they could spread the knowledge they had, spread the wealth of their own fossil collections by producing magic lantern slides which could be spread around the country and the world. And also by producing these interesting designs which pair the American Museum's display specimen with a painting which represents it in real life, which is an interesting way of showing the fact behind the science, but also a more exciting projection of the past. I think we have another one of these as well. The evolution of a horse was particularly fascinating to Victorian audiences because there was a very complete uh, run of it discovered in the 1860s and 70s, and you could really trace the way that the horse's uh, hooves had narrowed down to one, effectively, over uh, millions of years, and this was very much kind of a very powerful piece of evidence for evolution and natural selection, which can be conveyed in images like these, followed in a chronological manner. I think the next slide is the last one I want to talk about today. This is the Natural History Museum in London uh, in about um, the early 20th century. So this is kind of the spoils of the entire 19th century of fossil collecting. You can see the Diplodocus is going on tour now um, uh, in the background there, and the Iguanodon, which we saw an image of before. But really, for the most part, Victorians didn't have a great deal of complete dinosaur skeletons like this. They were very much interested in other aspects of paleontology and natural history, which maybe don't seem as apparent to us today, but it's worth mentioning that the word, the word dinosaur was coined in 1842. It was almost never used until the end of the century, and even in the 20th century, many people thought it was a kind of pedantic technical term. I think I'll pass on to Lynn. I
to colonial countries as well. So people started to think about traveling, traveling the world, and um, going places. And this is why um, Germany's not really existent empire uh, has been called the Magic Lantern Empire, because it depended so much on the public imagination. Um, that was in turn, um, that, that in turn depended on the, the Magic Lantern. Um, So from this point on, we would like to uh, invite both your questions and invite you to come up, view the lantern, come and play with sciencegossip.org and do some citizen science. Um, and, and to ask us, we're all historians of science in the Victorian period, so um, if you have any questions about science in the Victorian period, magic lanterns, or visual spectacle, we'd be very happy to hear. Do you have any questions? Yeah, you, it's not a question, but do you want to mention the feedback form? Oh yes. Um, so just before, we still have uh, another 25 minutes, uh, so there'll be plenty of time for questions and for the lantern slide. But before you go, if you could please uh, fill out one of our, um, our questionnaire forms on your way out. Uh, this is just in order to get a uh, greater understanding of, of the audience that comes and uh, how you perceived this presentation today. Thank you. Yes? So there's a whole range of techniques. Um, originally, it was painting directly onto the slides. Um, and later into the 19th century, um, when photography, so photography gets developed in 1839, but it's not really until about the 1870s through to the end of the 20th century that you get um, good photographic printing. So for many of you might know that early photographic images are made on glass slides. They're made on, on glass plates. But those are photographic negatives, and those don't project very well onto, onto slides, and they're also um, they're quite fragile, so you don't want to transport them. So what Magic Lantern slides are, are actually two pieces of glass 
um, that I have this, this um, paper tape around the outside, um, and then the image is drawn on the back of one of these, these slides, drawn or exposed through photographic means um, later in the century onto these slides. Some of the earlier, unfortunately we don't have some of the earlier, late 18th and early 19th century slides, but those are some of the most beautifully hand-drawn slides that you can get, um, and you get narratives of children's books, you get Gulliver's Travels that, that you could project up onto a screen and give a lecture, you get a lot of biblical scenes for biblical lectures, all beautifully hand-drawn. Um, so there's there's both hand-drawing and um, uh, reproductions of engravings and, and uh, photographic images of it. So are there particular age traces of artists who are renowned for that image? There are a number of, so, so one of the unfortunate aspects of the 19th century is that to be, like, like Leia, um, to be um, the um, craftsman behind both drawing and photography and a number of reproductive image-making techniques, um, whether that's engraving or lithography or um, magic lantern slide production, um, is what we as historians call invisible technicians. Um, these are people that work behind and as, as historians that we have tended to forget about. And to a certain degree, the public weren't supposed to see these people in the, the produced work, so their names weren't necessarily known. That's not necessarily universally true. There are a number of people who were both um, uh, producers of knowledge and producers of images. Uh, because, as many of you might know, to draw in the 19th century is um, a leisured pursuit. It's something that one learns um, through a general education. So there are lots of um, very well, um, well learned uh, craftsmen in the arts um, that do a whole range of activities. But unfortunately, we don't have some big names um, in, in terms of who drew these. We have companies. Um, you all three have dressed up magnificently, big Thank Victorian you. artists, <laughs> uh, but we've nevertheless heard a very modern view of looking back on these wonderful slides. Do you have transcripts of what the presenters at the time? would actually have been saying as a slide projected. I'm thinking in particular of the one with the three stars, the, the dog, the chimp, and, and the human. Yeah, so um, yes and no. So for, for some very specific uh, Magic Lantern slide collections, we might have mm -hmm. scripts. Um, so I've just seen a talk of, uh, from um, uh, someone who's doing research into um, the Scott Polar Expedition up to the north, and you have these wonderful Magic Lantern slides um, that were produced along uh, with the script that went with it. But one of the, the great um, misfortunes of these as historical documents is they're in the millions, so we have millions of them all around the world, and 95% of those are either uncatalogued or just scattered. So we don't really have, so the ones that we have are about, we have about 200 of them, and they're in a, they came in a wooden box, but they just, they, they came completely um, without any provenance to them. So we have no textual information that goes along with it, we have no narratives, um, and we have uh, no information other than uh, the bits that are written on the actual Magic Lantern slide. So some of them we, we know came from, uh, say, the Geological Society. They had they have loads and loads of geological slides, um, which would have had scripts to go with them. But um, almost every institution, university, schoolhouse, um, house would have had a magic lantern and magic lantern slides. So um, these these are very very proliferous objects um, with little uh, contextual information around them. Uh, might have been used for like studying literature as well. Sure. Yeah. Do you guys, guys want to? Does anybody else want to chime in on mm -hmm. the Magic Lantern? I mean, it's hard to imagine. <clears throat> honestly, you use magic lanterns for anything, not necessarily just science, but I suppose it depends on what you're able to project. So. You may be projecting the front piece of an image or a particular illustration of an image. But I suppose they're particularly relevant to science in it. You can demonstrate them with an image, whereas to stand there and lecture, describe, or quote, doesn't quite capture it. I mean, I don't know of any particular instances of lecture slides apart from, say, maybe a lecture slide to a literary and philosophical society because we're discussing a particular author, say, a lecture on Shakespeare, which was very popular in the 19th century. But I've never seen, to be honest, any slides as to what they're showing. Uh, in those, but Magic Lantern games illustrate just about anything. Um, but you do have to have something to make the slides uh, useful. Slides. Yes, question. Slightly technical question. How was the Magic Lantern light, the line light, generated for a small lantern like that? How did we generate the light, or how did they? No, generate? how did they generate? 
Um, so they had, um, well, for the gas lamps, um, they had uh, a large number of tubing that, uh, that went up the back of these slides, um, which would then pump the gas in from, um, from an external source. Usually at bigger lantern projection sites, they had a, a direct wall source for the, for the, the gas to come in. Uh, that, that would pump through these, these lamps and then there would be a, um, a gas flame that would be in the center of the magic lantern that then would be ignited um, and, and through kind of like a Bunsen burner um, uh, flame. And then they, there's a number of lenses. Usually, so we have here a big um, lens that sits right here, but they would often have a lens at the back of the, the magic lantern as well to project the light forward. I think also it's the introduction of the quick lighting, yeah. the gas flame, that would enable a, a relatively small flame to, to produce sufficient intensity or, or brightness. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, in terms of an order of the audience, So they, the, the brief answer is, is all of the audiences and all of them. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 there isn't one type of Magic Lantern show. Right. There is lots of commercial Magic Lantern shows which try to capture the so-called middle class, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, middle English uh, audience, which mm -hmm. is your, your kind of uh, working man in a profession with his family. Uh, but that is certainly not the universal. I mean, there's, there's working men's groups, there is um, these, especially places like the Royal Polytechnic in London and um, the Royal Institution in London, they had big magic lantern shows which were, um, well, well, the Royal Polytechnic and Royal Institution required one to come dressed um, nicely, um, which then is a barrier to certain income classes. There are lots of other types of magic lantern shows which are touring around the side of the, into the city. You could um, go uh, along the street and have one um, pay your penny to go see a magic lantern show. But this also builds into a lot of other visual technologies of the period. As Galen mentioned at the, same, the, 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 at the start, um, not just the magic lantern, but the, um, the panopticon, the, 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 the large theater one could go in and see um, a full 3D image was part of the same kind of visual technologies and visual rhetoric of the time. Uh, stereoscope, as, as Leah uh, pointed to, is a fairly economical way of viewing a new spectacular world. All you needed was a card and a viewer, right? And that anyone could do. Uh, even if you can afford to buy one yourself, there were loads and loads of stalls, street stalls and things like that where one could experience things like this. So um, it's, it's fairly fair, fair to say that most ranges of the political and economic classes in Britain would have had an experience, if not a set of experiences, just to say that the Royal, Polytech, uh, Royal Polytechnic Institute was effectively a private business and it did charge, often they, it was a shilling um, for, for the entrance fee. And, and most years they, they made a profit. They were rather like a, a kind of private university. Um, so often though they, the, the lectures were, were free, but we ought to be aware that one of the motivations for that was for um, what we might see as an establishment institutions wanting to lecture to working people especially in the wake of Chartism, in order to direct their attentions away from politics and sedition and um, religious dissent. And so it, it, there is a, a kind of an idea of, of a kind of top-down giving of information to people that, that will be safe, will be respectable. Um, so we all want to, to think of these things in an idealistic way, that, that often that ph philanthropy was, was kind of tinged with a, a desire to control the, the, the work of Following on from that, did you also have a, a sort of entertainment strand, sort of just education? I mean, you mentioned about moving the hands up and down, which hundred years ago would be entertainment. You would buy an entertainment now, who knows? So, you know, was, was, was there a kind of that strand of it in the. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, musicals and it's fairly big to fair to say that most Magic Lantern shows have an element of entertainment built into it to a larger or lesser degree. I mean, that's not to say there, are, there weren't some very dry scientific lectures um, that, that, that were projected by Magic Lantern, which wouldn't have had spectacular articulation, but um, the, the Magic Lantern is built 
um, so that one can do interesting things with it, whether that's dissolving a slide into the next, whether that is uh, moving a specific arm, or showing um, how things move from one thing to the other. So I, I think entertainment, we can't forget that most of Magic Lanterns um, have a um, have an educational aspect to it, but also an entertaining aspect to it. And, and I, I can add that I mentioned John, uh, Professor John Henry Pepper, who's the director of the Royal Polytechnic Institution, who was a chemist and a leading educationalist. But he's most famous for something called Pepper's Ghost, which was a phantasmagoric effect, um, which is the thing that brought most people into the Royal Polytechnic Institution, paying their shilling. And it, it, it was used in early cinema, I, I don't know the, the exact specifics of it, but it's a way of um, using a magic lantern projection and having a, a, a fake glass screen that the audience doesn't notice. And it looks as if there is a ghost appearing on the stage. It was used in a number of um, productions of plays by Charles Dickens um, to, to scare the, I mean, we, we have the tiger, uh, or the, the saber-toothed tiger intruding um, in, into, the, into the wood. But you could also have ghosts suddenly appear kind of as if they were here on the stage because we have a, a screen of glass. So absolutely, kind of entertainment was a, was a key use. I think, in, in a way, education and ent entertainment were often intertwined in, in the Victorian period and not seen as different things. Now, can we invite you to come up, to mill around? Please um, come and uh, ask us about sciencegossip.org or if you would like to see.